the reserve pointer. Yeah. So I need to still use the computer to do this. Yeah. Okay. Uh, can you do uh, Okay. Uh, our next speaker is Yao Yao. Uh, he's local here in Maryland. He's in the uh, uh, material science department, material science engineering. Uh, Yao does some really interesting stuff on uh, Wigner crystals and quantum materials in general, but 2D systems. He's been a, an assistant professor here for two years. Two years. Um, so thank you very much, Yao. Thank you very much, uh, JP and Nick, for the uh, invitation. So uh, today I will give an introduction about the Mori semiconductors. So I'm going to be focused on semiconducting Mori systems, in particular transition metal ditrocarbonide. And uh, I will give an overview, but mainly focused on the lattice structure and how the lattice structure influences both the electronic and also excitonic properties. Okay, so this is all of my talk. I will first give a brief introduction uh, and uh, trying to explain a little bit more about why these more semiconductors are interesting uh, for exploring uh, condensed matter physics. And then I'll talk about the uh, lattices and also attributes. Okay, so we already heard a very nice uh, introduction about transition metal ditrocarbonide. So I will only uh, describe a few things that's important for the purpose of this talk. So these transition metal are layered materials. Uh, if you look at their mineral form, you can see they have this layered structure. And if we isolate them down to single uh, atomic uh, monolayers, you find that each layer is made of three, atom, three, three atomic layers. So in the middle, we have the transition metal layer, and on the outside, we have oxygen atoms. The chalcogen atoms can be either sulfur, selenium, or tritium. And uh, if we choose the transition metal to be tungsten and the molybdenum, these materials are semiconductors. So if we look at the crystal structure of the monolayers, they have a honeycomb lattice similar to graphene. The difference is that now you have uh, two different uh, atoms on the A and B sub lattice side. So this broken symmetry between the two sub lattice, it means that you don't have any inversion symmetry in these materials. Right? So uh, you can define a, a, a orientation connecting the transition metal to the charcoal atom. This will point to a certain direction. And if you rotate the thing by 180 degrees, it won't be uh, the same. So this will become important when we describe the Mori pattern in this TMD system. Also because of the broken symmetry between the two sub lattices, actually the material is a semiconductor. So it opens up a band gap at the corners of the brilliant zone at the K and the minus K points. And uh, in the monolayer limit, uh, this corresponds to the direct band gap of the material. So material uh, has a direct band gap at these two points so they can emit light quite efficiently. And uh, you can actually also tune the band gap, the size of the gap, by just changing the composition. And you can tune it between one to two electron volts. So this is uh, pretty nice if you want to use them for uh, uh, visible optoelectronics applications. So there are already a lot of uh, studies on monolayer TMDs over the past decade or so. But more recently, people ha have been uh, really uh, getting more excited about these more systems in TMDs. Uh, when we think about these band walls heterostructures, uh, we can usually think about them almost as a sheet, uh, a bunch of papers stacking on top of each other. Uh, so if you are not, not as organized as me, you will always find these uh, papers, they will mis be misoriented with each other. So this to be aligned with each other. If you have two identical material uh, twisted with respect to each other, this creates a Mori pattern. Uh, as you can see from here, it creates a quasi uh, periodic uh, structure. And uh, uh, so you have a Mori unicell, you can repeat the unicell and create uh, uh, the entire Mori pattern. 
Another way to create Mori pattern is to have two these similar materials with different lattice counts. For example, if I shake, shake uh, scale one layer, uh, decrease one layer lattice constant, you can find that if they have a uh, lattice mismatch, you can also create a Mori uh, pattern and the Mori unit cell is also shown over here. Okay. So we can create a Mori pattern by either putting two materials of the same lattice constant together and twist them or putting two materials with the same, uh, with a different lattice constant. So if you have both lattice mismatch delta and also a twist beta, the Mori pattern uh, super cell, the, the lateral dimension of this uh, unit cell will be given by this uh, rather complicated formula. But uh, uh, for small theta and small delta, this approximated to a rather uh, a more, more simplified uh, formula shown over here. So you said delta is the, change, the difference in the lattice? Yes. Delta is a, a, yeah, is a lattice mismatch. Okay. So by looking at this formula, what we can find is that the Mori pattern, uh, if you have a small twist angle, the Mori pattern, the, this lattice constant will be large. And also if you have a small lattice mismatch, this uh, Mori pattern unit cell will also be large. So it will be inversely proportional to these two parameters. So in typical experiments, what we often use is to choose the Mori pattern to, uh, to the unit cell to be on the order of tens to hundreds of nanometers. And we'll come back to this point later. Okay. So now, once we have this Mori uh, uh, lattice, you can ask the natural question, how does the Mori lattice influence the electronic uh, properties of your material? And because I'm in the material science department, we always talk about the structural property relationship. So to understand their electronic properties, let's examine the structure of the Mori super lattices more carefully. So if we look at these high symmetry points, these points, uh, you can find that the two layers are almost uh, uh, aligned with each other perfectly. So one layer is sitting right on top of each other. So these high symmetry points, uh, we can call this RMM. The M, M uh, subscript and the superscript just means that the top layer, uh, both of these uh, transition metals are lying right on top of each other. Okay, so now if I move into a different position within the unit cell, but still to these high symmetry points, I can find that there are two high symmetry points. Uh, one of them we can call it RXM. So the uh, transition metal, is sitting uh, on the bottom layer, is aligned with the chalcogen item on the top layer. And also uh, we have, have another high symmetry point which, which is just uh, exactly the mirror symmetry of the Rx. Okay. So basically as we move along this Mori uh, uh, supercell, what we find is that the stacking order, the stacking configuration between the two layers varies uh, slightly or smoothly within this series. So how does this influence our electronic properties? You can understand this based on a very simple uh, naive picture. So we have two layers and they have conduction and the valence band edges. And the, if we bring them together by stacking them together, they begin to hybridize. And this forms a new band edge and the, the splitting of these two bands will be determined by how strong they interact with each other. And if we examine these three different scenarios, what you can uh, see is that uh, because of the stacking is different, their overlapping of the wave function will be different. So at these three different points, you would expect the band edge, uh, the energy level of these two band edges will be different. So if I draw the energy diagram or the energy band edge uh, within the real space, what you will find is that the conduction band edge, for example, will vary in space and uh, they will reach some local maximum or local minimum at these high symmetry points. So this variation in the uh, conduction band edge or the valence band edge is called the Mori potential. Basically, it's just the result of the varying stacking. And the depth of this potential is usually on the order of tens to hundreds of milli electron volts. And this can be tuned by various parameters, for example, by choosing different materials. Okay. 
So this is the marine potential, and turns out this marine potential is a really a exciting platform for us to investigate in a lot of differential physics. Uh, for example, the first question you can ask is uh, whether this marine potential is strong enough to confine positive particles such as electrons. Uh, so to estimate that, we can just uh, consider a simple uh, part, single particle in a box problem, right? So if, is the potential strong enough to confine it within one or your unit set? So we can estimate the kinetic energy based on the, of your electron based on the uncertainty principle and uh, plug in uh, typical numbers for TMD Mori systems. The Mori lattice site is on the order of 10 nanometers. The effective mass is comparable to the free electron mass. And we get uh, kinetic energy of electrons inside this Mori potential to be around 10 electrons. So this is usually smaller than the Mori potential you create. So we can confine the electrons inside these uh, potentials. So we can basically think about them uh, almost as quantum dots confined in two dimensions. So you create these discrete energy levels or marine uh, subbands sometimes uh, they are referred to. Okay, so this is interesting, uh, but a, a more interesting property is that not only you can confine these uh, marine electrons, you can actually also create this so-called strongly correlated basis, right? So if we have uh, just a quick reminder on what is a correlated insulator, if you have one electron per atom, uh, from the simple band theory, the material will be a metal. But if the electron actually has to transport, it has to overcome a Coulomb energy between uh, the neighboring uh, sites. So this Coulomb energy U, if the U is much larger than the kinetic energy, the material will actually become an insulator, even though uh, from simple band theory, you have a half field uh, electronic band. So uh, this is a classical correlated insulator or mod insulator. So we can examine the values of the kinetic energy versus uh, uh, correlation energy in these materials. Uh, the correlation energy we can simply estimate by the coulomb potential between the two, separated by the Morin lattice site uh, constant. And uh, once again, if we plug in the numbers, we find that the U to kinetic energy ratio is on the order of one to 10. So you can actually indeed reach the strong correlation regime just because uh, of this uh, confinement is rather uh, large. Okay. The important uh, thing to consider is that if we take the ratio between the two and then look at how they scale with different parameters, you find that the U versus W ratio is proportional to the effective mass and also the lattice constant and the inverse is proportional to the dielectric constant. So this makes the important the distinction uh, between TMDs and the graphene Right, so in graphene, you really need to go to the magic angle to have a large effective mass. But in TMDs, uh, because the electrons are already massive, so you actually do not need to go to this magic angle. You can create correlated states over a wider range of conditions. And another thing you can notice is that uh, if I just change the uh, Morier lattice, uh, unit cell size, I can actually tune the ratio between the U over W. So the, the overall, the material system is a highly tunable system where I can easily control various different parameters. And uh, in fact, this brings us to our, our next uh, uh, discussion, why these marine systems are interesting. They are interesting because they are highly tunable, right? So uh, well, of, of the motivations to study this correlated system is that if you dope uh, mild insulators such as copper oxide, uh, you can create a high temperature superconductor. And uh, this is typically done via chemical doping. So you substitute uh, certain elements or introduce new elements into the material, you change their stock energy. And uh, usually uh, you have to dope a large number of carriers Usually, uh, a few percentage of a few tens of percentage uh, of carriers per copper atom per unit cell in order to see these uh, interesting high superconductors. In two dimensional materials, as we heard from uh, the previous talk, there are actually interesting ways to achieve these, uh, these doping. So, you can just uh, build a simple capacitor 
and apply a gate voltage. And uh, this creates an electrostatic tension and uh, introduce some free carry. So you can use electrostatic gating uh, uh, rather than chemical doping in these 2D layers because you only have this, uh, the interface. If you do this on a bulk sample, you are only modifying the surface, uh, which is harder to uh, see any uh, effects. Okay. And another important uh, uh, issue is that, so even if you can do this uh, electrostatic gating, if you try to change the carrier density per atomic site, you need to really induce a very large number of carrier density introduce, to introduce this types of doping. But for marine lattice, because their uh, lattice constant is large, so you don't need to really induce a large amount of carrier density change in order to see similar uh, number of uh, percentage change. Right? So uh, you, you, you can reduce the required doping concentration by one to two orders of magnitude to achieve the same percentage of carrier density change. So, this makes the system much more tunable compared with uh, traditional uh, bulk materials or a material without the model. Okay, so basically we try to uh, look at the bigger picture. Uh, so you have this uh, Mori silver lattices. Uh, you have the parameters uh, which is given by the Mori lattice constant, the confinement potential. Uh, you can have tunneling between the lattice sites and uh, they will experience some coolant correlation. And uh, they will also experience some exchange interaction, which will determine the magnetic states of the system. Many of these parameters are tunable in the system. For example, I can remove some electrons uh, by changing their uh, gate voltage, and then I can add them back. I can tune their uh, feeling factor over a large range. I can also stretch the Mori potential by just changing the lattice constant. I can even change the depth of the Marie potential, for example, by applying a pressure and change their interaction strength. You can even change the electric field to change modulate the steps. And uh, this Marie potential basically is tunable by various parameters such as twist angle, pressure, and so on and so forth. Okay, not only that, we can actually also tune the interactions between the electrons. For example, if I put in the material or encapsulate the marine super lattice into different materials with different dielectric constants, I can change uh, the coolant interaction. I can even make, uh, for example, a graphene and change the graphene concentration and use the varying dielectric constant to modulate the uh, correlation strength. So basically you have a system that's a lot of these parameters are tunable. So now you can think about whether uh, we can use this for quantum simulations, right? So in AMOs, uh, people can trap atoms and they use, uh, change their parameters to simulate various quantum matter uh, physics phenomena. So in Mori patterns, can we do other things? We, although we may not have access to individual electrons, but we can change their global properties and then look at look for the interesting cases. Is the mass, the electron mass to run into your calculation, is that the bare electron mass from the underlying? Yes. Yes, it? yes, that's a, yeah. this is a simply by the estimation. So it's just using the bare mass of the free electron. So without considering the modification. Okay, any other questions? Okay, so hopefully this gives you an idea of why this Mori super lattice is interesting for simulating various uh, condensed matter physics phenomena. So now I will delve a little bit more into the lattice structure and also their symmetries in PMDs. But before that, I just want to quickly uh, mention how we make these kind of structures. So we use the rather crude, the Quite widely used the pickup method. So you use a rather sticky polymer and you have a 2D material sitting on a substrate. You use the sticky polymer to pick up one layer. And now you can use the layer that's already picked up to pick up a second layer. And you can reproduce, re, 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 redo this process many, many times to create a 
arbitrary type of pattern structure. The advantage of this is that when you pick up the second layer of the 2D material, their interface actually does not see the polymer, so you can create a rather clean interface. So how do we create a, a physics structure? We can just use, uh, sorry, the HBN is not showing up properly here, but uh, if you imagine there is a HBN, larger HBN covering the top part of the uh, PMD, the interaction between them is pretty strong. So if I try to lift it up, it will actually pick up only half of your TMD, and then you can introduce your rotation and put them back together again. So by controlling this uh, global rotation order, or rotation angle, you can control the relative twist angle between the two layers. Okay. Okay, so this is just one of the images of twisted uh, constant dactylinite. Yeah. Yeah. Can I ask? Uh, how do you actually do that? <laughs> do you have a, you know, do you have a press or something? Yeah, so it's modified from a probe station. So we, the probe station is a micro manipulator. So we change the, the, the head into something that can hold a polymer, uh, a PDMS and a polymer. So we can then manipulate the XYZ. So it will go up and down XYZ. Yes. Okay, so let's actually look at the structure a little bit more carefully. Yes. Right, can I ask, um, are the angles that are, like that looks like a pretty big angle, but the angles that are relevant for TMDs much larger than the ones that are relevant in graphene? Yes, the, so, so in graphene, uh, you need to hit the magic angle pretty accurately. In TMDs, the correlated states uh, happens over a wider range. So it can happen over zero to six degrees. So it has a lot more tolerance to, that, tolerance to that. But it is still an issue. You don't want to have a very large variation in the angle. Uh, we'll, I will discuss a little bit more about that later because the, that will determine the, the feeling factor. You have a variation in the angle, uh, it will introduce disorders. Yes. Yes. Yeah. So yeah. So we actually try to uh, not contact the PC with uh, the TMD. So we try to, uh, for example, using a thicker HBN so you can block the contact between the the region. Yeah, so one has to be a little bit careful. So there's a lot of art in making this pattern. Okay, so let's actually look at the structure of these twisted layers. Uh, as you can see, we, we need to make them in the lab. When you grow these materials, they don't crystallize in this physics structure. And this is because uh, they have the energetically preferred orientation. And we can actually get some useful information by examining the preferred orientation that occurs in nature, right? So the, most the thermodynamically stable configuration that you will mostly find is called the 2H phase. So you have one layer, uh, as I mentioned, the transition metal and the oxygen atoms, they are uh, inversion. They don't have inversion symmetry. So the first layer is pointing towards the right and the second layer is pointing towards the left. So there is a 180 degree rotation between the two layers and they are sitting right on top of each other. So this is called the 2H phase. Okay, so this structure is now inversion symmetric because these two are rotated. But in some material, you can also create the three R phase. Uh, so in this case, you actually have the in the left in, in your crystal, all of these monolayers have the same crystallographic orientation. But when they stuck on top of each other, they don't like to sit right on top of each other because uh, it's of the electrostatic co uh, considerations, they actually shift a little bit with respect to each other. So this forms the MX configuration, and this is called the CR phase. So if you look at how they actually form this kind of AB stack uh, when you create these structures. So because the nature always prefer this phase, we actually can know that uh, this 2H phase is the global energy minimum for the stacking configuration. And this CR phase is a locum energy. So any twist angle between the two will have a higher stacking energy compared with these two orientations. 
So what does this mean for our uh, twisted structure? Okay, so once again, if we look at the twist structure, we have the RMX and R RXM. These A, you can also call them AB and BA configuration. So this is twisted near zero degree. Uh, this is the energetically favorable. If this is a metastable state, but you cannot rotate them by 180 degree. That's the, that's the idea. But if we look at these high symmetry points, which is RM and phase, so, uh, it's not shown here, but the two layers are perfectly aligned. These are not energetically favorable. So you have a higher stacking energy at this point. So what can happen is that uh, because this point has a higher energy and this point has a lower energy, the Mori pattern can relax locally. So near these points, the Mori super lattice will relax and form the RXM stack. We essentially will try to maximize the area of the PX, uh, the, the RXM stacking and also RMX stacking and uh, minimize this R, uh, RXX. So instead of having uh, two rigid lattice stacking on top of each other, what you end up having is two uh, formation of domains uh, of RMX and RXM. And they are connected by the domain. Okay. So this is a, uh, this is a quite complicated scenario. And you can see that there are two competition effects. Right? So on the one hand, the formation of domains minimize the stacking energy, what we can call E1, but also because you are deforming the lattice, you pay an energy penalty to the, uh, for the elastic energy. For the so for a small twist angle, you only need to deform the lattice a little bit in order to form this perfectly stacked uh, domains. So for low twist angle, uh, this domain formation is favorable, but for larger twist angle, you need to deform more, more and more, so it becomes less and less stable. So there is actually a critical angle for this domain formation. Okay. And uh, now if we look at the case where you rotate them close to 180 degrees, so previous case is zero degrees, you see that the rotation angle actually plays an important role in the overall structure of the domain. For example, now uh, at the 180 degrees, this HXM, so transition metal sitting on the metal atom is actually the energy favorable condition. So I, I will try to maximize this area and this leads to the formation of a hexagon instead of uh, triangles in your domains. Okay. So in reality, you can actually observe the formation of domains by various techniques. I think we'll hear more about this in the uh, upcoming lecture. Uh, but essentially you can use either TEM or STM or STM to image the domains. And you can see that for example, near zero degrees, it has this angular shape, and then near the 180 degrees, it forms this hexagon shape. Okay. So why uh, why do we care about these domain formations? Well, there are at least uh, several important uh, consequences or implications for how we understand the Mori physics. Right? So originally, we were considering a smooth variation because the atomic registry is smoothly varying in the two lattices. And now if we, they form domains, uh, they are actually described by some um, perfectly stacked domains and then a very sharp change in their stacking configuration. So the Mori potential, instead of having this smooth uh, varying uh, shape, it also could probably look like some smooth potential, but uh, they are separated by uh, very sharp walls at the domain boundary. And turns out it has been suggested that uh, for certain materials, you can actually get interesting physics such as new topological phases at the domain walls. Uh, going to describe that too much in detail, but more importantly, from a practical point of view, <coughs> what you can see from these studies is that if we look at a typical uh, sample, <coughs> Uh, under the PEM, you see that there is a varying in the domain size. So the domain size is determined by the Mori lattice constant. And this means that uh, the local rotation or the local twist angle is actually varying uh, 
to a large degree within a sample. So if I try to measure any global properties, such as electronic or optical properties, uh, it's actually pretty hard to tell uh, what is the uh, actual rotation angle uh, or what is the main contributing factor to our global measurements. So it is very important to understand how these local structures correlate with their functional properties. So indeed, there has been various techniques trying to uh, establish a correlation between your local domain structures and your local electronic and optical properties, for example, using SPM or scanning probe. Uh, uh, so you shine a laser on EFM tip to look at the optical response. And you can see these domains and map out their response. But one of the challenges, of course, is that you need to have exposed the surface. Uh, you don't want to have any be an encapsulation on top of your marine landing, otherwise you lose the resolution. So it's still quite challenging to actually uh, image your domain structures inside your fabricated device, meaning that the marine lattice is encapsulated in an HPA. So I will talk a little bit about how we can achieve some of this in my data. Okay, just a quick summary slides before we move on to the electronic and the excitonic properties. So basically, the crystal structure of the domains uh, of the marine lattices can be actually rather complicated. Uh, you can have domain formation, and they can have different symmetries, uh, depending on different twist angle and the material combination. So it's important to use microscopic characterization techniques to uh, actually look at these domain structure. And very often, we see a large variation in the domain sizes in the local twist angle. So we actually have to think about how can we understand the global properties and also how to establish this structural property relationship. Okay, with that said, I'm going to describe very briefly about these correlated electronic states in more recent times. Because we will hear more about it in the upcoming lectures, so I will keep it relatively brief. Uh, so it turns out that uh, uh, typically we can measure these uh, samples using a double gated structure. We already hear, heard a little bit about it. So you can put these twisted or the better structures of TMDs uh, inside the two layers of HP and graphite. So the advantage of this is that you can apply both a top gate and the bottom gate voltage. For example, if I apply negative voltage on both gates, I introduce holes on both layers, but there is no net electric field across the two layers. So I can control the total density inside of the two layers. I can also apply a positive voltage on one layer and a negative voltage on the other. This produces an electric field across the two layers, but net-net, we don't have any free charges inside the material. So by tuning these two voltages, I can control two parameters, both the density and the electric field. And this will be an important uh, tuning parameter for us to modulate the Mori super lattice. Okay, so in order to study how the material uh, responds to this gate voltage, you can just do a field effect transistor measurements. You can pass a current in this in-plane direction and measure the voltage to measure the resistance of your material. So it looks like your voltage contacts on there are on both underneath where it's stacked. Uh, does that matter? Uh, so which part were you? Uh, so like your two inner contacts on the actual picture, they're not both underneath where the two WSE tubes are stacked. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So ideally we want actually to cover the whole region. So this is not a perfect device. We can only do termi two terminal devices. Mm, gotcha. Yeah, but the, the, the hope is to you create a large enough structure so you can actually do it. Okay. That's a good question. Okay, so this is a transport studies of a twisted uh, transition metal die to So what you can see is that when you twist them by a small degree below six degrees, you actually see that once you apply a gate voltage, you put holes into the system. Uh, when you hit the band edge, the, conduct the resistivity begins to drop, but at a certain point, it begins to rise again. So you see actually a resistivity peak at these different points. 
and they change with a twist angle. So when you go to higher and higher twist angle, this peak shift to higher and higher densities. So if you try to estimate the carrier density corresponding to these uh, peaks, you find that this uh, at these peaks position, you actually have one electron per Marie unit cell. Okay. So if you go to higher twist angle, the Marie unit cell becomes smaller. So you need to go to a larger voltage to go to the, the, the resistive peaks. So this is an indication of formation of correlated states uh, inside these twisted bindings. It turns out that transport studies are actually quite complicated uh, to do. We need to make special contacts, and it's quite difficult for TMDs, especially at a low temperature. So another te technique people developed is to use an optical technique to probe the conductivity of your material. This is a rather elegant experiment. You can apply an AC voltage to only part of your device. So this is a pedal structure, but you only apply the AC gate voltage in this switch. When you apply a high enough frequency uh, voltage, the contact resistance actually frees out, so there is no carrier injection from the contact. Rather, the, con the, the carrier begin to redistribute themselves inside the heterostructure. Okay, so the, uh, think about the electrons inside the bucket. You are shaking the bucket, so the electron begin to move around, and how fast the electron move around will be reflect is uh, the, how conductive your material. So the more conductive material, the electron may fast move around with a higher, uh, larger concentration change, AC concentration. So the change in the AC, uh, uh, conduct, con, con, AC, conductive, AC concentration change can be actually monitored by an optical method. So I can actually just look at the, the optical reflection of this ungated region and how large uh, the AC modulation is will reflect how conductive it is in the intent direction. So using this method without doing a proper transport method, we can actually, uh, people have actually identified a few additional resistive peaks between the mu equals one, be between the half feeding and the band end. So it turns out you can actually have one third and two thirds feeding of the Mori lattice, but still see an insoluble state. So this was explained by formation of generalized original crystals. Uh, instead of having one electrons per Mori unit cell, you're actually forming this kind of regular electron lattice structure that's pinned by your uh, Mori lattice. And then they form only at these particular feedings when you have this regular commensary stack. This is a nice technique to use optical methods to infer conductivity and turns out people can also just do direct optical measurements of the correlated states uh, and they infer their existence. So I think you'll hear about more about this, so I will skip this. And then uh, I'll now talk about the excitons inside these more semiconductors. Okay, just a very brief introduction on what are excitons. We know that in semiconductors, one of the elementary excitation is uh, excitons. So you can have an electron and hole, and they can bind to each other and form this hydrogen like particle called excitons. Their energy is given by the band gap energy minus the binding energy of the exciton. In PMDs uh, or in other 2D materials, the exciton binding energy is particularly large because the their low screening effect and also their heavy electron mass or hole mass. So the result of this is that the binding energy is on the order of hundreds of milli electron volts inside these materials compared with just a few milli electron volts uh, in say gallium arsenide. So the excitons in these TMDs are very robust. They can exist at high temperatures. And also the electron and the holes, they are very close to each other. So they are very likely to recombine. So they have very large oscillators. So this leads to very strong optical response of the excitons. So why is the Mori uh, super lattice interesting for excitons? Because Mori super lattice can not only trap electrons, but also trap excitons, right? So previously we talked about the change in the conduction band edge, but this also applies to the overall band gap size, right? So if I go across the Marie super, that is the band gap will actually vary in space. So because the exciton energy is determined by the gap energy minus the binding energy, 
you can think that this will also confine the exciton uh, and the electron. So why is this interesting? Because excitons can interact with light. So if we can, instead of confining a single electron per uh, Mori unit cell, if I can confine single exciton per unit cell, I can now create a single photon emitter that's a regular space to create a quantum emitter arrays. But in order to realize this, we actually have to have strong correlation between the two to form this single particle shape. And uh, of course, for exitons, because they don't have a net charge, their interaction is pretty weak. They are given by this dipole-dipole interaction. So how can we inter in enhance their interactions in order to realize this quantum theory? So this is one. Uh, interesting direction you can pursue when you go to low density regime. And another interesting regime you can uh, pursue is to go to the really high density regime and uh, see possible both Einstein condensate of the excitons. Because the excitons are, their uh, mass is quite small compared to its atoms. So you can actually, uh, as long as you can create a large density of excitons, you can actually induce a both Einstein condensate of them at a rather high temperature. So this was first predicted by uh, uh, to, to to happen for just monolayers made without the Mori lattice. Now, if you have the Mori lattice, this Mori lattice offers a natural trapping of the excitons. So you can locally get a high density of excitons inside these Mori traps, and uh, you can enhance locally their critical phases. So perhaps this offers a natural way to create exciton condensate. Okay, so in effort to realize these interesting physics, people have been looking at uh, the excitons in these Mori supercells. So one way to look at it is just to use a photoluminescence spectroscopy. So what we can do is to shine a laser that has energy above the band gap of your material. So this will excite the electron holes. They will relax to the ground state, which is the exciton state, and then we re-emit the light at a lower frequency. So you can collect the light that's re-emitted by the material and then just put a filter to, filter to reject the laser excitation and then look at their spectrum. So by doing this PR spectrum, we will review important information about the energetics of the exit. Okay, in, rea uh, in reality, when people do this kind of experiments in other structures, they often find some discrete peaks of the excitons uh, in the materials. So, uh, this has been attributed to the quantum confinement of excitons, right? So we find them into uh, in small boxes, they, their energy is a discrete. Right? So what we, our group has been focused on is to look at the homobi layers, how the twist angle controls the exciton properties. So what we can do is to vary the twist angle and then look at how the exciton properties changes. Uh, what you can already see from this figure is that when you change the twist angle, there is actually a large variation in their emission property. So the energy of the exit can be modulated by just changing the twist angle. And uh, in these bilayers, it turns out that excitons can have two types. You can have two types of excitons. You can have the electrons either sitting in the same layer. This is called an intralayer exciton. But you can also have uh, Electron and the hole sitting in two opposite layers. So this is called an interlayer. Experimentally, we can actually distinguish them by applying a perpendicular electric field. As I mentioned in our previous slides, when you apply a double gate structure, you can apply a perpendicular electric field. And uh, because the energy of the exciton is given by the uh, dipole moment about it, uh, the dot product between your dipole moment and the electric field. For this intralayer exciton, its energy will not shift as a function of electric field, but for interlayer exciton, it will shift. And the, the, how fast they shift will tell you how well separated the electron holes are uh, in the vertical direction. So when we do this kind of, kind of experiments on a twisted structure, what you can find is that for these higher energy peaks, the energy actually does not shift as a function of electric field. So these are coming from the intraday excitons. But for lower energy peaks, they split into two 
uh, we have this X shape, this linear slope tell us you have a finite data. And uh, you have an X shape because you have both X axis times pointing up and pointing down. So one of them will have a higher energy and the other one will have a lower energy. So okay. okay, so that's good. So we can understand this. But uh, the question is that we know that we are probing multiple domains in this structure. Okay. So I'll, I'll go quicker. So because we are, the domain size is on the order of tens of nanometers, we are always probing multiple domains. So how, in order to actually better understand this, we can create a structure that with, with a very large domain size. So near zero degree twist, you naturally form these uh, irregular domains. And what you can do is to look at the individual domains because now the domain size is larger than your laser spot. And what you find is that at least local domains, single domain, you actually only have the uh, excitons that's shifting so you, instead of having an X shape, you have a single uh, slope rather than both slopes. So this means that in this RXM domain, for example, the electron holes will actually have a preferred orientation. They actually prefer, the electron prefer to sit on top and the holes prefer to sit on the bottom. If you go to the other domain, the scenario is flipped because they are connect, connected by the mirror symmetry. So basically what this, uh, tells us is that inside, inside these two domains, because the electrons are experiencing different crystal structures, the two layers actually have different uh, energies for the electrons. So even though these two layers have the same composition, but the, because their stacking is different, uh, the electrons can spontaneously become layer polarized. So there is a built-in electric field in this uh, uh, RXM configuration. So and it turns out you can also flip the domain size if you move to the right edge of the sample uh, of, of your elect electric field, you can actually flip the slope, which means that the electron holes are now inverted in real space. Okay, so we can map out the stage. And uh, before I conclude, I just want to briefly mention this results. As I mentioned, it's very important to actually know what kind of microstructure you have in your device because when you actually make the structure, uh, you there is a large variation in the twist angle, local twist angle, and this can act as disorder. And it's typically quite hard to do it uh, for an encapsulated sample because uh, the HBM prevents you from seeing. So what we have recently developed is to use the SEM technique. And by just looking at the secondary electrons, if we look at the sample from a particular angle, we can actually see the domain structure, even when the material is encapsulated inside the HBM. So in a fabricate, this allows us to actually image the domain structure inside a fabricate device. So now we can actually see, for example, this part has smaller domain size, this part has larger domain, and then I can move to optical characterization and then characterize their optical properties. So this helps us to establish a correlation between the local domain properties and the actual optical properties. So I'll skip that uh, and uh, talk about uh, some challenges on this. Okay, so as we can see, the Mori system really forms a very exciting platform for us to investigate various type of things. So you can tune the competition between your correlation and the fluctuation, your kinetic energy by changing different parameters. What I didn't mention is that there is also topological effects in these more subbands. I think you will hear more about it later. So you, there are various interesting phenomena you can realize in these more subbands. So potentially you can explore a lot of physics in a single um, single device. And of course, the challenge is that the, when you actually make these kind of structures, there is usually a large variation in the Marie's uh, wave vector or Marie lattice cut. So how can we overcome this challenge? One way is to make better uh, control over their local twist angle. Uh, the other way is to actually make a heterostructure with no twist angle. So even without any twist angle, if you have a delta, you can create a Marie lattice. So you can use the thermodynamics of these two 
uh, layers interactions to form zero to triangle structure and create a more regular lighting structure. But of course, how can we grow these type of tether structures with high qualities is still an open question. Okay, and a lot of people are also exploring rotatable structures, so where you can uh, dynamically change the global twist angle and explore how this influences your uh, device property. Okay, on the other hand, perhaps we can also look for other ways to create these uh, confinement potential, as we heard from yesterday, the night uh, you can pattern dielectric or local gates, and potentially you can do it for very small scale, you can perhaps realize similar physics. And another method that our group is exploring is to use, borrow some ideas from the AMO physics, and we actually impose an optical lattice on the uh, electrons or the excitons and confine them in these regular lattice. But of course, to do that, you need to really have a, a very sub-wavelength scale uh, system. So in, instead of using free space optics, perhaps you can use the near field of the surface plasmas. So by patterning these plasmonic structures, you can create very tightly confined optical modes and potentially confine them uh, in a regular lattice. Okay, so with that said, I would like to acknowledge the key co 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 contributors from Harvard and also the UMD uh, two, uh, three students and also we are collaborating with Mohammed uh, on some of the projects. And I um, also thank the funding agencies and uh, thank you all for, for your attention. Great questions. Can you go back to what is the first slide where you were talking about the variation in first angle and the very obvious Yeah. Yes, sir. No part of that. Well, okay, my, my question is going to be it looked like there's it wasn't this one, it was oh well you can sort of see it on there. Yeah, you can see over here. Right? It's like a massive difference between one region and another. Exactly. What happens? Is that like a some defect in the crystal or what's yeah? So actually you can consider these as so uh, in here so you can dis consider these as dislocations because if you move from one domain and the other, the layers are shifted by one atomic size. So these can be considered as dislocations. So these formation of dislocation are related to the strains in the material. If I try to look at the, how we make these structures, so you are putting these structures on a deformable substrate the polymer, and you put them in contact, usually at the angle, so it's not perfectly flat. And then when you pick up, it's actually sometimes, especially when you try to rip it apart, sometimes it's a quite violent process. So during all these processes, there are chances you can create inhomogeneous strains in your material and then uh, create these kind of disorders. So uh, this, this kind of variations in the size of the domain. I think this is uh, the main uh, contributing factors for creating these very structures. Here and then Thank you. So the question I have is, how do we maintain the separation between the two layers constant for a large distance? Or is it constant or is there a consideration of defect? Yeah. So the, uh, that's a good question. So the separation between the two layers will be determined by the, sorry, I don't want to go through here. So because there is actually no, molecules between the two. So the separation between the two will be actually determined by how strong they interact with each other. So this is not something that can be easily changed. You can change the external parameter, the pressure, to change how close they are each other. But the interesting thing is that uh, the 2H phase and 3R phase, they actually have different separation, slightly different separation uh, because of their stacking energy difference. So actually we try to look at this kind of structure. What I talk about is the in-plane relaxation, right? So this part can become RMX by 
a local in-plane distortion. It turns out there is also an out-of-plane corrugation. So basically at this point, you can have a larger separation compared with this. This is a very small separation. You can only see it in STM, maybe a few tens of picometers, but there is indeed a variation in the separation. Thanks for the talk. Uh, I'm just wondering, like, uh, uh, usually, like, contamination gives a lot of problems. And how do you deal with your case? Do you, like, stuck in in, in, in the atmosphere or, like, just on air? Yeah, so actually, with stuck in air, so it's actually quite remarkable that you can actually get quite a clean interface uh, just in air. It depends on your material, of course. So, for some material, you really need to do it in an oxygen free environment because they can react with oxygen. But for these TMDs, as long as you do the process relatively quickly, you don't wait too long before you stack them, after you exfoliate them, you can actually quite, still get quite clean interface. And what's the time between, if you said quickly? Yeah, so like it, within several days, it is considered quick. So yeah, so you don't need to rush it. <laughs> Yeah, about our next talk. So I have a question regarding the excitonic part. Also, I noticed that it seems like the uh, interlayer excitonic energy is quite comparable with the uh, interlayer. And uh, I think like this material is very tree like spider one material. So I, I like how could I understand why these two energy scales are so comparable? Yeah. Okay, so that's a good question. So the energy of the excitons, so we can understand this by the Gap energy minus the binding energy. So it turns out the intralayer versus interlayer exciton in this case corresponding to a different band gap. So for the intralayer exciton, we are actually located at the K point. So the electron and the whole both are at K point. So you can have a direct transition. Let me just go to the next slide. Okay. You can see that the intralayer exciton have a higher energy. And the, the interlayer exciton has a lower energy. When you do photoluminescence, the exciton always relax to the ground state. So one may expect that you only see the interlayer, but you are seeing the interlayer exciton because they are coming from this direct transition. So you can have a very large oscillator strength. So they can recombine very fast at this direct transition. For the interlayer exciton, however, they are actually coming from an indirect point. So for example, the Electrons may sit in at the K point, the holes may sit in at the gamma point at the center of the brilliant. So this is an indirect transition. So this is a phonon assisted process. They have a smaller band gap, so that's why it has a lower energy. Uh, and uh, they don't dominate the emission because it's an indirect transition. This one is a direct transition. So even though they are at a higher energy, you can still see it in the photoluminescence. So, energy like inter interlayer, uh, it's not energy, right? So, how would it relate to, to uh, strain? I think it's strain because it's dynamically, yeah. So, that is parameters are changing. Uh, so, it's not a time if you once you make the structure, the structure stay in place, so it doesn't change uh, dynamically, but you can apply a strain to change the material. Happening in plane, this exotonic. Yes. Uh, so there's no current. So I'm just uh, shining. Uh, oh, so, okay. yeah, yeah. It's, it's not shining. Uh, not, not applying. I'm just applying a gate voltage. So there's the electrostatically changing, but uh, you are not passing current. I have two questions. Uh, what's the Lifetime of the exciton. Yeah, so the exciton lifetime is pretty short in these materials because they recombine very fast. For the in, in, intralayer excitons, they are sub picosecond, so a few picosecond or even hundreds of femtoseconds, so very fast. But interlayer excitons, they can actually have a longer because the electrons' holes are separated, so they can have longer lifetime. It can range from several nanoseconds to even microseconds. So that's actually uh, really long. So actually, that's one of the things I didn't discuss because they have such long lifetime. 
we can actually see them diffuse overall space. So we inside just within one micron, and after some time, we will actually diffuse outer to a larger range. So actually, by measuring how the excitons diffuse, uh, we can infer whether the material is conductive or not. So this is one thing that we are doing now. I had a question so, in general about 2D materials. <laughs> it's a lot of, you know, you're hearing a lot about TMDs, yeah. prepping. Yeah. Do you see or do you know about other materials that are being worked on doing these kinds of experiments? Yeah, so I think at least graphene and TMDs, they are the kind of the most mature materials and they're relatively easy to work with. So that's why people, a lot of people are working on it. But I think there are many other opportunities for other materials. For example, people nowadays are working on telluride. People used to avoid the telluride because it's air sensitive. But it turns out the telluride can have some special fine alignment with rise to interesting topological figures. So I think there are many interesting directions. Perhaps we can have so all of these uh, like kind of uh, triangular structures or hexagon, hexagon, hexagonal structure. If we can make other type of structures, then we can realize different types of Hamiltonians to simulate. So I think that would be very interesting. Oh, oh yes, quick question on the domains. Is it possible to use like? Annealed the material and then apply a field to choose one domain over another? Yeah, so that's a very good question. I think it's not very well understood right now because uh, it's actually quite hard to uh, image them or to characterize them for now. But uh, with the development of these different methods, I think it will be an important uh, thing to look at whether you can anneal it to into a more regular structure. Uh, that's so good. Okay. We're done. Okay. Thanks very much, Yo. Okay. Lunch of time. One hour to one to one PM will be the final lecture. Thank you.